Lovely. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. So hopefully everyone's got that happening um, and uh, we'll proceed on the way. So the title here is Delivering a Design-Led Sustainable Packaging and Brand Portfolio. And I'm your presenter, Michael Greemer. And for some reason we're having... There we go. Okay. So a bit about me um, already. Jenny has uh, introduced me, but... Uh, Look, uh, 28 years clicked in in the year 2020, but uh, look after a couple of areas, as mentioned at the start, I'm an industrial designer by profession. So I sort of look, look at uh, the designs I work on from that particular lens, and I've been able to branch out to two different type of businesses. So one being predominantly packaging, which is a focus of today's presentation, which is Q-Design, and also one in the last two or three years, which has branched out into service design, custom experience, and looking at things from a system point of view, which is probably quite apt considering our future in the packaging game. Um, and that's the Pack Collective. As you can see there, probably apt for the current climate. Um, our business is very much focused on consumers and building from that once we sort of, un, I guess, unearth those uh, unmet needs. And we tend to respond nimbly, flexible, and uh, quite passionate in our approach. Um, as far as uh, elements that relate specifically to packaging, this is a Good broad mix visually, it shows some of the experience that we've uh, been exposed to, predominantly myself. As you can tell, fair amount of rigid plastic packaging, predominantly, fair bit of work also in the dairy industry, so this is quite apt for the audience, but also specifically being exposed to a numerous range of packaging materials uh, from uh, you know, predominantly injection molding and thermoformed plastics. Um, we also have blow molds and bottles um, there covering HDPE, PET. Uh, looking at EBM and injection stretch by moulding materials, as well as tapping to things like glass um, and cardboard at, at times as well, probably the lower end of the spectrum. But as you can see, all these have start from insights uh, with the insights team, marketing, et cetera, and going all the way right through for development, uh, commercial reviews, logistics, supply, manufacturing um, to the marketplace. So right from end to end from a traditional stage gate perspective. Moving on. The second part, which is probably more apt for when we start having conversations around circularity um, and also infrastructure, it's the, uh, I guess, service design, We're looking at system mapping. So we have another business which looks at that. So cognitive load and mapping the journey of items from start to end and really have a chance to understand what the job to be done is and also how it might be delivered to that service. So these will have a nice little role to play in packaging and actually have stem and grown from their packaging experience over the last 25 years. So getting straight into it, when we approach a project uh, from sustainability, the first thing we actually look at is taking a step back, not getting focused too much on materials, process, machinery and commercials, but have an understanding about who our consumer is and what their unmet needs are. So we look really at a user-led approach. Um, people know this is design thinking um, or user-led thinking, but essentially it starts at understanding what are the consumer insights. And this really helps dictate what the job to be done is or what the need state is from the consumer. And uh, most of the major brands that will be on this panel and obviously in the industry usually have a consumer insights team that help dictate um, and direct marketing, which then leads out to the pipeline development towards the packaging development team. So really, really the pivot point of directing why something is required. Um, from that, we wanna make sure from a packaging design perspective that whatever we deliver to the marketplace is actually engaging to the consumers. And that needs to address predominantly, not only their functional needs, which really comes down to the mechanics that we might deliver in a package, but also their emotional desires, realising that what they purchase is a reflection of who they are. So that it has to be a balance um, in, in whatever you deliver. And it also reflects the brand as much as it does reflect the consumer as well. So the engagement to the consumers actually dictate the length and duration of product on the marketplace and also therefore is profitability. So if we get that part right, it ultimately helps control and dictates the overall life and return at particular product. If you skip that and be focused on uh, end uh, focus or efficiency only, it doesn't really engage the audience who are actually parting money to buy that product. The other part we tend to look at, um, which is a little bit now actually not working for some reason, is, uh, uh, that's interesting. I've actually had everything seize up on me at this end, Jenny, for some reason. Oh, 
apologies for that. Um, hopefully we've got everything working a bit better now. Um, so on those three points there, these are really focusing on looking outside our industry. So for those that are involved in the innovation R&D side of things, trying to look for inspiration, um, sometimes I find from experience, it's best to actually look beyond the category, look beyond the industry and try and knock down to those things that are quite important. So if we look at say Dyson as an example there, um, for uh, his development for his particular Dyson vacuum cleaner, his inspiration was pretty much looking for suction or a sucking device. And he didn't find that looking at vacuum cleaners. He found that looking at wheat silos and turbines. So that really comes down to getting inspiration, innovation from that point of view. And the last two points there is understanding what, um, how people behave really. So a lot of focus groups happen at major brands, um, pay a lot of money for that process as well. We tend to focus more on what people actually do rather than what they say. And that tends to lead direction for any developments that we are from a design led perspective. And the last point is obviously making sure that after all that great effort that a brand might develop to put on market, part of the sustainability cues is ensuring that whatever we develop has to be universally accessible. There's no point getting to the market and then actually limiting your ability for your particular customer to have access to your product. So part of that uh, journey, part of that thinking behind it goes to this process theory. Um, so for those that may be familiar with Bob Cooper's stage gate process is, is one. This is one which is pretty much along the design thinking approach where empathy is probably the very first key step. And that really gives us a guiding light. If you can't really empathize with your audience or their needs, it's very hard to identify the key reasons why they wanna come back to your brand and why they wanna come back and engage with your particular product. The rest of steps from two to six follow, I guess, traditional stage gate development process um, in definition, um, ideation and prototyping, where we start to get more tangible aspects to validate that it does work. That testing is all important to make sure things meet shelf life requirements, development to market, run on machinery, and that detail refines it ready for commercial launch. So it's a very linear model, very orderly, very controlled. What we tend to find though, is that this ends up looking like the project reality. So it does tend to be a little bit of a jumble box from that point of view. But the key point is, is making sure that we have a system in place. That the first point of call is really empathizing with your audience from that end. So getting to the topic of about sustainability, you know, really ask yourself in your own organization which reflects your culture, what does sustainability mean to a brand? And certainly from our years in the game, it can mean about customization, where a product might line up to what your brand purpose is or virtues. Um, it could be about wanting a green solution. Um, what does that actually mean? Does it mean really greenwash? Is it perception of what customers feel sustainability is and you appeal to that in your packaging selection? It could be about compostability, and that certainly has garnered a lot more interest in the last few years. Um, but again, understanding when to utilize the compostable solution. Um, we we'll touch on that later on in the presentation. Um, obviously wanting to own the IP is, is a common link, making sure that you have some protection and, and coverage of what you do and put out to the market to, to, I guess, justify your investment, but also wanting to be plastic free. And we see that certainly from consumer sentiment, pushing towards retailers, which then push on board to the brands that supply that. And that certainly can be a combination of correct information, but also misinformation in a lot of contexts as well. Um, the need to be reusable is certainly picking up with the push towards a circular economy, retaining value into the system and not seeing packaging as waste. This is a word that is certainly growing with a lot more anticipation in the last few years and really directing towards our future. And of course, the old chestnuts that we wanted yesterday, which is pretty much goes uh, part of course in our industry. And of course, we want it cheaper than current. Who's not heard of the word cost neutral? in you know, their day-to-day work in the R&D field, in the FMCG sector in particular. So moving forward, the whole grower behind this is that we're pretty much living well beyond our limits. Um, as we know, overshoot day, we're sitting globally at about 1.7 times uh, Earth's resources we actually produce in a year or actually call upon to use in a year. Um, and certainly we have to break it down to the way that societies live and work. This is a good uh, little snapshot, which you'll have in the PDF deck later on but it gives you an idea about the different days that um, would uh, appeal around the world based on where you come from. So for instance, in Australia, I've highlighted there, if the world lives like us in the way that we have a very convenient life, um, a very developed world, um, we all have quite large houses, um, a lot of energy requirements, 
If everyone lived like that, based on our population, we would actually use up all of Earth's energy by March 30th, which is about 12 days away. So um, that's something to consider. And uh, certainly we're actually improving over time, dare I say, but you can get a good snapshot of where other nations sit. And you start to look at the back end, those that sort of November, December, will actually have less pull on Earth's resources from that point of view. Obviously, as we know, many of you on this call will be across most of these about the amount of energy that we use, both in water, the emissions that we produce, but also the amount of food that we also produce and waste. And that's something which is evident across our industry and packaging has a massive role to play in that along a global supply chain. With that issue, obviously, is the impending approach of uh, 2050 and, and this number 9.7 billion was banded around uh, certainly the uh, last couple of years about being almost apocalyptic in its number about the ability for us to sustain current um, agriculture methodology to provide uh, feedstock to this sort of number of people in that time frame. But with that, of course, that increase of scale comes perceived packaging waste and where it goes. So our systems really weren't developed for those numbers and weren't developed in a way to actually support, handle, distribute and actually put back in the system the increasing volume of packaging waste that we generate. That obviously is a negative aspect of packaging. What we try and focus on is that reality is packaging does have a very important function to play. When we look at the three main, um, I guess, categories, um, look at meat, fish and eggs as, as one primary category, dairy, in particular focus on fruit, vegetables and nuts in the produce sector. We can see from this uh, evidence here from Carly Vahas and we've gone through some research that the packaging format itself actually has a very small impact um, on its environmental footprint. Um, in particular, looking at the, uh, the meat or protein sections, only 2%. You focus on dairy, it's no more than 10% when you compare to 13% of the wasted food in that supply chain and up to 75% waste from what is consumed, which is pretty much what happens to us as consumers. What do we do with it? What happens at food service and where it actually goes? So although they have a very bad image to, um, out in the consumer set and in the public, we actually have a very important role to play in preserving all that effort energy we actually pull out of the ground that we harvest in our agricultural field and get out to the consumers. I won't dwell so much on this, it's in your deck. Um, I'm assuming all those on the call are APCO members, and this is reported regularly, but it gives you a sense of how much we actually consume from packaging as it trickles all the way down in relation to content source, post-consumer recovery, um, and also packaging recyclability, and a few targets that we're aiming for, that we have a job um, to really focus on and try and improve the way that we get that recyclable content up we start to really improve the way that we have post-consumer recovery in particular, but also where we actually get content source of um, recycled content as well. So we're actually doing well in some areas, but uh, still a fair way to go in, in others. So getting down to the industry per se, we start to understand how we've educated the consumer over time on what is sustainable packaging. How does that look like? And so a quick review, um, this is back in 2011. So over in the UK, um, seventh generation launched this in a laundry category. And again, we go back to those simple cues. If I'm touching it and feeling that tactile feedback, it's a molded pulp, oh, this is sustainable. So if you make the package too incredibly different, of course, you then scare the consumers away. So they've obviously played to the overall shape, um, the mimicking of current bottles, but using a medium which actually encourages recycling, or in this case, also composting. And have tried to aim towards lightweighting the amount of plastic that's being used. In this case, putting the key product inside the actual flexible bag, but playing on that familiar look and feel to dictate what sustainable packaging might be. So over time, we start to have brands really, you know, start to, to determine a purpose and bring forward global issues. And the Method brand is based over in the US, uh, and they worked with um, essentially, I think, TerraCycle um, initially, but also Envision, who is a supplier, where they harvest ocean plastics and really really went ahead and actually created a statement to actually bring it to the consumer conscious. Now, this is going back eight years ago. It, Ocean Plus has probably started coming more into the common vernacular, maybe a couple of years ago, even three or four years ago with more waste in particular. But this is a way that a brand in itself can bring sustainability forward to the consumers and make it a point of, of impact and also 
and advocacy for their brand. In this case, he has done a great job. And this is still actually on, on shelf, I believe, but actually in this case, not overly commercially successful in relation to the energy, time and cost required to get ocean plastics. At the same time, it's using it to highlight a cause. And therefore, as we've seen, the CBIN project, the ocean cleanup project, all that has spun from this awareness, which is built from brands such as Method eight years ago. We start to look Sorry, at Michael. more... Sorry, yes. it's Phil. How are you? Hello, Phil. <laughs> um, I just wanted a quick question on the, the ocean plastics one. So you said something about the energy. I'm really curious to see, you know, do they actually have like a carbon footprint or something on that to prove that 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 is the best use of the ocean plastic? I'm not certain if uh, Tom and the guys have done an LCA specifically on it, but uh, certainly what it was used for was predominantly to make awareness. So again, making people aware, consumers about this issue in the oceans, and this was the vehicle to do it. So in that particular case, it becomes more strategic. Yep. Um, and again, this is not really an ongoing um, major skew. They're not, they're not, if you look at their method um, portfolio of products, this is the only one that um, specifically calls upon using ocean plastics. Most, yep. again, have a closed system, but this is really for highlighting an issue. Thanks, mate. Okay. So moving on, this is going back again, 2012. This is actually in Japan. So um, we start to look at uh, how uh, governments and society make changes. This is the Sprite bottle you can see on the right. Um, and what you notice here is that the bottle is actually a clear PET. Now, if you go and buy a Sprite bottle today in Australia, it's still a tinted green. And for those that are across the, the recycle requirements, um, basically there's money in, uh, in clean PET and there is demand for it. When it comes to coloured stock, that demand and uh, that monetary response actually drops away. So here, eight years ago, Japan basically outlawed any coloured PET. Um, yet from a brand point of view, as strong as Coca-Cola and with the Sprite brand, they found a way around it. So again, working with their particular infrastructure, which is very unique to ours, admittedly, they've gone ahead and realised that you know, thin films that sit on products, as you can see from the QP product range to the left, um, they're usually waste to energy programs, but the actual core rigid product, the one that has the higher pack to product weight ratio, that's kept as a clean stream to retain its value in the recycle stream itself. So again, it makes it for easier processing. That's really designing upfront, considering the infrastructure in the back end. And again, eight years ago from that point. If we jump forward to last year in particular, that, that now that movement towards a circular model, what does that mean? Those in industry understand what that might be, some better than others, but certainly in relation to what consumers see it as, this is the first salvo really of getting it out to the market. Um, we're well aware of Keep Cup, similar type models, the Return R, which I'll touch on later on as well. These are ones that are more localised side, but this particular one, which is uh, the brand Loop, which we know is partnered up with Woolworths nationally, which I believe will be launching later on this year in store, is that old milkman style of where basically you get a high lasting durable pack, um, you use the product, you collect it, you return it back, that is sent back to be cleaned and refilled and returned back. So that changes the whole business model that we're used to seeing today, which is lightweight, high speed, um, high volume, and getting it out to the marketplace, for us now we're going to almost antithesis of that and going to something which is more durable, um, appealing, and definitely long lasting. And this is an example here. This is uh, Todd Scarzi, who's actually the founder of TerraCycle, was in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago. I had the, the pleasure of actually um, catching up with him. But, but what I love this little statement here is that understanding the value of design is actually um, increasing that level of desirability and retention of the product packaging. So from an industrial design point of view, it's going back to really upping up the specification of that product, making far less of them and keeping that value locked into the system. And one of the key things they do to actually measure that is put some simple metrics. And one part is demand that any package it employs has to be used at least 30 times before it's recycled. So from a design brief point of view, that is very different to what we're used to from designing high-speed packaging. Um, the other part as well is to keep it truly circular. The key part is to make sure whatever is retained back in is actually recycled back to the original product. So you're not talking about downsampling or taking it as a flexible bag and it comes out as a park bench or it comes in and goes towards a road base, which is still a closed loop method, but it's not a circular model. Whereas this is built around a circular model. It basically, basically coming back as it was originally intended to be supplied. So, that is the macro level. Now let's get down to some of the key design principles that 
now, in our industry, we need to actually go forward and use day to day to deliver a sustainable solution. So let's focus on what we have available to us as tools, kicking off with sustainable packaging guidelines. Now, these are the 10 key principles that hopefully all of you being APCO members are well aware of. Um, this is the, the updated deck, which I believe was released around December last year. But essentially, it covers the 10 key points and criteria that APCO have rolled out for our industry to help narrow down and reduce the impact that our packaging that goes to market has on the environment. I'll touch on most of these in the coming slides. The other part is also the questions that we actually ask ourselves from a decision-making process. You'll notice on this list of the questions on the far left, we've got things like reduce, reuse, recycling, composting, and so on. But these are all guys where you start to indicate where does your product sit currently? Where would you like to shift to? And some of the provocations you might want to ask yourself that might lead you to make more informed decisions. Taking the next step, we've also now also got a, an online tool. So those that are familiar with PREP, that stands for Packaging Recycling Evaluation Portal. Now that is, if you're an APCO member, um, that is made accessible to you. And that allows you to actually review, um, analyze your current packaging, put in specifications, and it can basically inform you whether or not that would be suitable for our recycling infrastructure, both here in Australia and also in New Zealand. Once you've identified that, the next part is actually informing the consumer, and that is by the Australian Recycling Label or the ARL. And Planet Arc actually control all the consumer um, push education on that front. But you in the packaging game of brand owners have this as a tool to help better inform your consumers to make wise choices once they've finished your particular product. So I'll break through all these essentially as we go forward. But as you can see, those 10 principles are pretty much uh, at the top of the tree and supported by what you're putting through PrEP. And that PrEP then informs the way that you instruct and direct consumers on PAC. So kicking off with design for recovery as a starter, this is looking for basically the waste hierarchy. So Ad Lansic uh, designed this back in the mid 60s. Um, so a Finnish politician uh, by chance. But the key thing here was understanding where we sit on desirability. So obviously we start looking at landfill, which is at the bottom, obviously being the least desirable. Um, Australia's still pretty much reliant on that. And as we know, we have broken systems. Most of our product ends up in landfill. Um, the other part is we're looking at materials that are recycled, most likely in other products. Um, we will touch on them later on, but sometimes they go back into, into packaging. As you can see, this sort of mid-level. All I'm trying to push towards is obviously reduction and avoidance of particular materials um, and, and packaging, um, but certainly encouraging the reuse to retain that value back in the system. Gets mined once, get processed once, but can be used 30, 50, 100, 10,000 times, depending on the medium chosen. The next step is looking at material efficiency. Um, in this case, as we know, when it comes to flexibles, I've used flexibles purely for the base of the audience today on this one here. Um, we know curbside films aren't widely recycled at the moment. Um, we have one system through Red Cycle, which I'll touch in a bit more. So the challenge is, do you worry about designing flexible packs to be recycled, or do you just stick with what you have right now? The key thing is some of the ideas and, and really push towards is actually design it to be optimized for that. So it comes down to, material selection, whether I'm going forward and aiming towards 100% plastic pouch rather than multi-layer formats where possible. Um, we understand there's gonna be compromises on shelf life, on barrier. It's working with the material technologists in those supply areas to work towards one, which is what we class as recycle ready. Um, ideally aim to use one polymer type. It keeps simplicity in play in those particular areas and allows people at end of line to be able to process and handle a particular product. The other part is to avoid hard to recycle materials. So PVC and PVDC are, are classic ones, and we'll touch on a bit more on that with a, a scale used by Recycle down the track. But obviously also from a decoration point of view, to keep the stock as clean as possible, maybe consider minimizing your print coverage or using lighter colors. So those in, in marketing or brand, considering those particular points when you're designing your colorways. The next part is looking at recycled materials. Now for those in the food sector, um, that's being predominantly used in the shippers and outers and cardboard. And probably I think from the latest app code data, about 49% of the board out there is, is from a recycled content. So that's really hitting the marks on that side. And obviously it's being used also for mediums such as metal um, in particular, but also in for non-food um, items. When it comes to food products, it's a little bit more difficult, um, but it has been used in, in our pet, in other areas. This is an example of uh, one which is in our cup. So you can see a lovely collaboration there. 
uh, most recently Australian Open, where they recycle the coffee cups through Simple Cups um, uh, basic collection system, and then close loop um, in joint partnership with Nextech, then transfer and confirm and compound that material down to a usable blend, which is then moulded and comes back as a similar type keep cup style, but one which actually has enduring use, uh, longevity, um, and now a durable item which actually made from recycled cups, really, really close to a circular model in that particular case. Looking at renewable materials, and this is obviously with the, um, the desire and onset for compostability. Um, obviously the key part here is to make sure that it's hitting standards and standards that are actually in line with Australian use. So we've got two standards, which I've got captured here. Um, the first one there, AS4736, really focuses on commercial compostability, um, which we know we are limited um, in this country and in some cases don't have access to it. Um, and the key one also is home compostable. Now, I haven't got the hard facts through here, but I know through the resource map that APCO completed also last year, I believe around about up to a thousand tonne of compostable packaging was out in the marketplace. So quite a small amount overall, one would assume also from films in particular, um, but also from a home compostable point of view, less than 10% of the general public have access to home composting. Even if you do, uh, the question becomes about its efficiency as well. But certainly if you are going towards that area, it's certainly making sure that you minimise the print coverage, obviously make sure it's heavy metal free, in particular when it comes to ink usage and adhesives in particular. But also the key point is to making sure you provide advice to consumers on how to compost the pack. We don't want this to get into existing recycling streams, but we start to contaminate high valuable feedstock. Um, and so when you start to look at the reasons why you might use compostable uh, packaging as an example, suggestions are by guideline, is that basically where packaging is heavily contained with food? It is certainly an option. I've got a, a Hootie Marky um, tray there as an example at a fresh range. Um, but also we've got maybe an event um, or a council or some closed area. We've both got packaging and food collected as one um, in one separate collection and therefore it's being processed together. What we want to try and avoid to do is uh, actually use compostable materials as a replacement to already well-established recycled materials. So again, from a system thinking point of view, we know we don't have a system which is perfect. We know it is on the road for improvement, but we have to obviously stick with systems that do work and not contaminate what little we actually put in that feedstock currently. The other part is litter. And this is obviously a challenge with many of these on the go, ready to consume products. And the three on the right are classic examples of that. They certainly service well at stadiums and events on the go examples and our um, convenience eating and uh, QSR days. But obviously the issue is, we've got to ask ourselves, is your product that you work on, is it likely to be consumed away from home? And then if it is being consumed away from home, what instructions do you provide the consumer to dispose of it responsibly to minimize the chance of it being litter? How many components might you have? Is it a cap, lid, or seal? And what, from you as a development point of view, can you reduce or redesign the pack to either avoid or reduce the impact it might have if it is littered by consumers? Because in the end, we don't have that choice. It's up to consumers at that point of consumption. And the key part is, you know, what advice do you provide consumers to dispose of it correctly? Um, so again, the other option is also considering about, you know, from home recycling, compostable aspects do come into play. As you can see in the far right there, there's some in a lot more development in some more speculative materials when it comes to seaweeds and plants that basically immerse their way into a carbon-based material once exposed. So there is still development happening in that particular place, but again, a space to watch over time, but one not to encourage poor behaviour by littering as a, as a first step. Um, transport efficiency. So again, this is really when we start to look about maximising that movement um, and really some of the considerations are making larger pack sizes um, to reduce that pack to product ratio. Again, I've used flexibles here as a, as a bit of an example. Um, looking to minimise the empty space in, in the pack as well. Um, and ideally, um, if we try to look at con you know, combining primary and secondary packaging as well to optimise efficiency all the way through the transport chain. So again, as we realise that a lot of these ready to deliver on demand uh, businesses take off, there's a lot more transport on the road. So maximising how you deliver your product from end to end is a key consideration. And again, APCO has some really good guides on how you would do that. But the key thing there is to making sure that whatever you're developing for your product, it's actually designed from an efficiency point of view, first and foremost. This is the part we mentioned earlier about putting the consumer front of mind of your development. While the parts were spoken about already, focused more about end of line 
about making it uh, a design that's suited for our infrastructure. This is one that doesn't forget about you as a consumer. There's no point delivering a product to a consumer if their experience with it is poor. Um, from a customer experience point of view, we refer to that as a very negative NPS or net promoter score for your brand itself. So ask yourself, has the consumer access to the product been considered within your packaging design range? So on flexibles, have you provided an easy tear option that allows them to get into there? I've seen many cheese packs over time where they might have easy peel, easy open, but either the graphic um, that's been put on there is poor, the, the seal end is actually not designed a way to facilitate easy opening, the colour selection has been poor on contrast, or the point size has been quite low. So even though you spent the money, the infrastructure and time to develop a functional pack, the way you've communicated and delivered to the consumer has resulted in a negative impact for the brand and therefore not redesigned really for accessibility. So some guidelines around that, that Arthritis Australia actually have as a separate document, way too much to cover in this particular format, but it's about a 20 page, for, uh, page actually go through, which gives you some specific guides across various packaging mediums as well, beyond flexibles. The last part there is talking about design for education. So this is after you've done all the work, you've developed, you've redesigned your pack, you've considered consumer needs, you've referred to your prep tool, it's giving you guidance on the best way that is gonna be designed and recycled at the end of line, if it's captured in the recycling chain and curbside. The other part is actually, before we get to the curbside bin, when I've had your product, how do we educate and tell me about what to do with this product? Um, in the past, we've relied on, unfortunately, using what we used to call the PIC, or Plastic Identification Code, um, wrongly as a recycle code. And you still see it today on many council bins on the underside of the bins themselves. So we have a couple of systems in place here. We have Recycle, which covers predominantly soft plastics, and I'll give a bit more focus on them down the track. But that is a logo that for those that um, join up to the Recycle program, enables a way to take this product out of curbside, out of landfill, return back to store, and allow it to be captured to be at least coming back into the chain for some value and out of landfill. The other part as well is also making sure we're using these new codes to actually make sure we've got cut through and information for the consumer. So not using simple no beer salutes without no direction, not using PIC um, or plastic identification codes to indicate recyclability. Uh, two key areas to avoid. But the key part is giving consumers the benefit to make a wise choice that you direct on pack. So for marketers on the call, be aware of that consideration, make some space on the pack to inform that. And there are actually plenty of guidelines from the ARL um, via APCO that specify various sizes depending on the size of your particular pack as well. So looking at infrastructure, you know, and this is where we end up with our pack. It's a lovely little map um, that uh, I got hold of at a, a recent talk, which indicates how it is globally. So many of the brands on the call, you don't exclusively sell your product only into the Australian market. Australia and New Zealand are very similar. As you can see from that little diagram, there are some variations between uh, the way that we handle both deposit systems and combustion, as an example. But for those that may export across into the Southeast Asia region or have dealings in Europe or in South America, there are very different infrastructures at play. What we may put in place that might be relevant for the Australian marketplace may not be relevant across in certain areas. As you can see in the Southeast Asia region and even the Middle East, there's still a, a fairly high um, requirement there for, for landfill. There's no deposit schemes, no combustion, uh, no recycling at all, hence all the big red discs. Whereas if you go to sort of Northern or Western Europe, you can see a lot of green, which is a yes across the board. So they have deposit schemes, they have waste of energy via com combustion, and they have um, basically no uh, landfill use uh, at all. Um, so they've actually got other areas of actually retaining the value into the marketplace. So that gives you a nice little snapshot of what's happening globally. Moving to the prep report. Now it's a pretty busy slide. You'll have this deck to review later. But again, I'm assuming that everyone being an APCA member have access to the prep, um, have also seen the prep. This is a bit of a snapshot from my own little dashboard. Um, as you can see on the far right image there, that's my little dashboard there of various projects I tend to review and, and look at. But you can see it does give you a top line level about looking at what's not recyclable, what's recyclable with lost value um, in particular, what elements might be recycled and other areas that might require further instruction. But basically what the prep tool is, it's an online tool that allows us to holistically review the recyclability of your package. And that's basically in line with the mixed recycling facilities that we have in Australia and New Zealand, and ideally for access to those that have 80% access to uh, those areas. Now, you basically use this at the start, you know, either reviewing your existing 
uh, packaging to understand where they sit to actually improve them and part of your action plan or if you're actually designing uh, a new pack format to understand where it might sit as a benchmark and what you may need to go off and do to improve it. So this is an example of um, a couple of packs that we've designed in the past and this is actually uh, on the previous version of PrEP but as you can see in the middle one where it's got the red box saying it's not recyclable even though this pack is a polypropylene material, there's a couple of non-conformances here. One, the fact we've used a black plastic, which doesn't get picked up in the MRF itself um, by the NIRs, and which is a near infrared system, but also the fact the lid itself, even though it's clear, even though it's polypropylene, the fact that when it's in a it compactus, it flattens down to a dimension which is actually seen as a card and therefore gets incorrectly moved across into the paper stream where it's identified and then diverted across the landfill. So from a design point of view, what can we do? Well, if we move across and obviously either move towards a clear or white material, that'll give us a tick for the container. From the lid at this stage, still non-conformance, but from a design point of view, we might look at actually redesigning the lid to make it bigger or reduce the ability for it to be collapsing down, and that'll give it a tick, and therefore it's fully recyclable on the stream. This is where PrEP can be used as a tool to give us information about how it might be handled end of line and help direct our design at the start to move from a non-recyclable material to a recyclable or therefore sustainable offer. Another example here with bottles. Um, on the far left, a handled bottle, which unfortunately is a, a requirement to be made out of PVC. To the one on the right, which is one we worked on, which is a PET bottle. This is the latest version of PrEP, which is now nicely integrated into the ARL. And as you can see here as well, that we have a situation where the bottle itself is seen as not recyclable being on the PVC mainly because of the fact it's not recycled due to low volumes, but it also contaminates the PET stream. So we can go ahead and change the design, in this case, moving a handle away, reducing the volume of the actual bottle from um, basically less than 1.5 litres, so that we can actually avoid having an open handle. and allows us to actually use it towards a PET format, which now gets across to the far right. In this particular case, it's still coming up as recyclable, but lost value. In this case, it has a contamination with regards to the label. So we can do development on label selection, material selection to try and move it from an orange to a green. And that's part of using this tool to help facilitate and direct how you might move from a non-recyclable, non-standard material to much is better um, lined up for our MRF system at the end of line. And the last one here is one that looks at items that are for litter. So I won't read through the detail, you'll have a deck afterwards, but basically this is essentially like a little source pack that we're all familiar with at footy games or events. On the far left, it's a PVC base with the polyethylene sealant, so mixed materials. PVC we know can't be recycled, but we have our H in there as well, but it has a non-conformance across the board. Well, let's move it across to an APEC, so more recyclable material, but the PE near the OH have an issue with regards to its ability to be recycled, plus it's still a quite a small pack, it's less than 50 mil square, therefore it's still a non-conformance. So using PREP again, looking at option B, how can I actually design this pack to give us that green tick across the board? So this particular case here, yes, we can go with APET, but use that particular water-soluble sealant layer. And we also increase the physical size of the pack. That allows me to get ticks across the board. So I've used this now as a tool to help inform and direct my design. And that now leads me to one that actually is a green tick for our particular system. The next part then will be go off and actually validate we're hitting shelf life, we're delivering performance in the consumer's hands, it still requires an align our line of efficiency and supply chain. They're all things that will come past, but now I've actually shifted my product from the far left to the far right, using prep, understanding how things are being handled in the recycling chain as well. Okay, IRL. And this is the Australian recycling label. Um, and again, I'm assuming that most of you guys are across this, but um, moving on to the, the next slide, sort of talk a bit more about what these are. And basically this is a tool that we use in industry to help educate correct behavior for the consumer. So this is where we've moved on from dispensing, having a Mobius loop or recycling code on the actual box or packaging. Um, each item here actually has the indication whether it's recyclable, whether there is a condition to be recycled. So for those that are in flexibles, it will have a restore drop off or return to store for that particular case. Or if the item is not recyclable, so we're we making wise choices by the consumer at point of disposal. And the way it's designed out is to focus on package component as well as giving instructions for the consumer itself. And here's some examples of where a combination of using PrEP, getting instruction from the ARL and how you might go back and redesign the pack actually as informed direction. On the far left, a great example there of a Tampa evident um, in model label pack where it breaks away and now creates a litter situation. 
by doing some subtle changes on the base material now allows that to stay as one piece. So that gives us basically a conformance for this iron to go ahead and be recycled correctly. As we know, with carbon blacks as is an issue, you can put in either removing carbon black or putting master match traces. That allows it to be captured and seen through NIR. Uh, and on the far right, again, same exercise, moving carbon black, and then also making physical design changes by integrating certain parts together and reducing the color to therefore ensure we've got less parts going out and broken up into the system. So again, using instruction from PrEP and ARL to help improve your design to make it more sustainable. From a red cycle point of view, for those that are all in the flexible format, um, this is a guide that you can actually get um, access to on PrEP and it does break down looking at all the different types of materials and polymers and their blends. Um, the red cycle logo is informed instruction that you provide the consumer on pack itself if you are a red cycle member. And as you can see on the, on the, uh, the green, the monopolymers, very simple polymers are all in, um, HDPE, uh, polyethylene, PP and BOPS. But then when you start to look at more complex functional type materials, um, there's limits on how much we can use. So still PVDC can be used, but a very small amount. Likewise with your pets, your nylons and so on in relation to the red cycle um, process. But outs obviously at this stage are still bioplastics for the contamination, things like PVC and styrenes and obviously increased increase the amount, sorry, of uh, the PVDC and all the pet nylon and so on for the range. But again, that is a built-in aspect within the prep tool itself. Moving forward, um, when we start to look at soft plastics, um, again, mostly would be across the main structure of how um, barrier flexible packaging tends to work. We have a, obviously that print um, aspect, a tire layer, um, if required to build into that more functional thinning gauge in the middle, which gives us those uh, requirements for oxygen barrier or light barrier. And obviously the bulk, which reduces the cost of the item and gives us that nice production feedstock in the sealant. This is pretty much the structure today. We start looking for the future, we want to try and move across to this more simpler uh, material structure, ideally the far right with the monopolymers or in the intermediately looking at those sort of clean blends. So we start to understand where we sit presently, we have predominantly non-recyclable or lost value materials complex and in structure, but doing a very good job for the core product on the inside. Over time, we're looking for that shift. We're looking across for a balance of that compromised performance. So what's the shift on barrier life, on the shelf? Um, how does it impact my yield on the production line? And what's it do with regards to my cost of goods in the item? Reality is when we start to make that shift, all those areas are gonna have some compromise. And the question is to go back and maybe question legacy data and say, well, what do we actually have a need to have a two year shelf life. Um, what do we require in relation to supply across the export markets or are we actually over specifying the material? In the goal to try and make sure we move towards a future which has got more retained value by having simplistic forms which therefore allow it to be recycled. And again, that may be also by the fact that having multi-packs might do the very simple, more recyclable work, but the bulk pack might then do the functionality to actually reduce the amount of non-recycled materials in the feedstock. That's a potential for the future on that side. And we can see it happening right now. Sadly, we rely on Red Cycle um, through all the major retailers to um, supply and, and take out the, the waste that comes out of the flexible strain. But the great thing is over the last uh, six months in particular, a lot more activity has happened in the marketplace with partnerships happening in, on the far left, you can see from PepsiCo and Red Group and Clean Up Australia, but also initiative that uh, we know um, IQ Renew have done, which is um, obviously working from the, the chemical recycling side with Nestle, Pacific Energy now bring it at curbside. So although we are limited with say Red Sock at the moment, the future is looking pretty bright in say two years time, when a lot of these pilot trials get scale, start to roll out to the curbside collection, which hopefully over time, will allow a lot of the flexible formats to be deemed as recyclable along a particular infrastructure. So if we look at the dairy industry at a whole, we've gone through formats, we've gone through ARL, we've gone through instruction. How well have we actually educated consumers today on flexible packaging? This is where it sort of sits. We're improving, um, we've got a bit of way to go. Um, this is a, a very, very simple study of going out into stores to sort of late last year during uh, the last dairy um, conference. But we did notice um, out of 10 packs there, only a couple actually use the ARL um, and then provide clear uh, instruction in line with the APCO guidelines for disposal. Um, there are a couple of packs there that give some instruction um, on there, but we did notice that three out of six of the packs in the dairy industry actually do not even give any instruction even be it from a recycle or disposal thoughtfully. Um, a lot of information in the back, as you can see from the images, but nothing in relation to consumer guidance as to what I do with the actual pack itself. So improving, appreciate some are still rolling out over time, um, but that's an area we need to probably improve uh, over time as well. 
So this is a great little quote I got from Tom where overall this, our focus has been around just recycling and really handling the garbage crisis, but we have to look at really questioning our fundamentals of development and design. So circularity, which is obviously uh, one part that we're moving away from this sort of reuse model and moving towards a true circular economy. And again, making a call here that most of you across the Alan MacArthur Foundation and obviously what the circular economy model is and keeping that value back into the loop. Um, also an extension of that, we also have what is called the new plastics economy. And you'll notice a lot of the APCO guidelines that we have at the moment are actually covered and in line with a lot of the six points that are covered through here. So again, we're talking about removal of single-use plastics, um, adopting reuse models where applied to try and reduce the single-use items as well. Ideally aiming towards 100% reusable, recyclable or compostable packaging, um, but really pushing forward to keep that value going in. Um, a deep dive, which you'll have on the deck is contained here, and it gives you some more direction. Um, I do recommend that post this session, if for those that aren't across this, um, recommend reading this, getting a sense of how this lines up to your own action plans or even your own guidance and how this might impact your own business models as well. And then when we start to look at guidelines, um, this is one which actually is available for free. So if you go to the Alan MacArthur Foundation website, um, IDEO, who are a strategic ID firm, have actually created a circular design guide. And if we go back, quickly navigate through here, if we go back to what I covered at the very first start, that empathy component in our journey, this is really understanding the journey that needs to happen with both the product and the consumer. Once we understand what happens through that, we can actually pick up all the touch points and moments that matter through that part. Once it's identified, we can now zone in onto the actual material and the product. We can start to pull apart what the parts and materials are, what the after use scenario may be, what process is involved and how that impacts production and sourcing. The whole goal here to try and keep it back into the system. Once we've identified that, we can then move across to understand with each of these particular materials, where do they go after their current use in the cycle? There's a whole list there that goes through. It gives you some provocations and prompts and questions, and it allows you to actually navigate your way through and fill in those blanks. And if you go back to what we've just gone through on the prep tool, that really focuses on basically end of life in relation to recycling. What this is, is around capturing the value in the system and not needing to go back to version stock and actually having a complete system design approach in that, in that area. So here's an example of one where it's actually functioned to scale. So Fuji Xerox actually back in 1994 realized at that point they were, they were sitting right out in the landscape that we need to improve how this actually sits in the marketplace. So they actually built a model uh, around actually keeping 99 plus percent of their product into their system and retained for value and it's simply done on this product stewardship map. So you'll have this as well, but as you can see in the guts of it is pretty much the traditional model that most of us tend to work with. We produce a product delivered to a customer. Key part there, they had a collection system which they controlled and that allowed them to sort and assemble to recapture that value back. That went back to their own recycling or back into their feedstock for remanufacturing. And then obviously that then allowed them to actually cascade its way out to either downcycle or other old items that are keeping that value locked into the system. So therefore they were achieving the 99% reuse model in their entire business. So some of the key learnings from that, again, it's a 25 year old circular business model. One of the key things there, they took responsibility. They didn't wait for government intervention. They took it for themselves and designed a system that suited them best. They created their own integrated recycling network. As we saw recently with a number of brands out there in the news in the last six months, partnerships, working with other people that are deep dives in certain fields to allow them to build a network around. They established a secondary value. It wasn't a waste. They had a monetary attachment to the outcome of that end of life and that therefore drove and seemed to put it back into the system. And the very first starting point was designing their product with a closed loop mindset from the get go. So we're talking about this stage moving towards understanding recycling mindset this is going the next step again, understanding what does that look like from a closed loop perspective. And here's an example of that in play locally. So those are things with the keep cup, this is uh, uh, the brother of the founder, Abigail, um, on his return R system. But some of the key things here, I've linked up on the top left there, straight from our sustainability packaging guideline on the reuse questions, we start to look about you know, using a metal product. So in durable item, it basically gets borrowed and comes back to certain outlets. You exchange it for another one, so it stays in the system. But the key thing here, actually the bottles, the bowls, sorry, themselves are made from mainly recycled content. 
Um, it's designed to have more than 10,000 uses and it gets recycled back into the bowl. So going back to Tom from TerraCycle, that's purely that, that true measure of circularity. And on a high volume, large global brand point of view, you say, okay, that's really good for a quirky, narrow um, stream, Deliveroo cafe style. How's it going high volume? Look what Coca-Cola's doing in Brazil. They've actually gone off and redesigned their actual CSD bottles to actually have an indirect um, deposit on purchase. It's encouraged with incentive to get that money back when you turn it back to store. And they retain back in their system for cleaning, refill and reuse. So they're actually looking to ideally move to 100% of their, uh, I think it's a quarter of a billion bottles they actually produce um, in Brazil to move a lot of these single use plastic items straight across into 100% of it by 2030 into a reuse model. So this is again taking single use plastics beyond essentially a recycle model. We look at RPET locally and so on. This is going the next step into circularity at scale, at volume with the global brand. So last slide here in summation, looking at the waste hierarchy, approaching the systems mindset, and then looking at strategy from a sustainability point of view and all of it aiming towards a circular economy. So look mostly at current state, we either have landfill or materials going back into other products. And from a strategy point of view on the pyramid, we're looking at more compliance on the current state, probably efficiency. But our future state really is pushing up the waste hierarchy, looking at materials going back into their core product again, thinking about reuse and reduction if required, approach it from a system thinking point of view. The solution is not about a widget, it is about a system approach. And it then becomes a strategic fit, becomes a priority in the business and integration within a number of stakeholders. And that then leads off essentially to a circular economy model. So I'll cover all that there, pretty much what I've said. You'll have that on the deck. And this is a really great summation uh, from John Alkerton. We're basically we're pretty much screwed if we maintain as we are. We have some great tools we have at our hands through APCO to improve our linear and our recycling model, moving us towards a circular model. And pretty much, if not for them, I'm simply doing it for humanity and do it for love of family. So thank you. Wow, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Made it just in time. <laughs> oh no, that was absolutely brilliant. Folks, if you'd like to um, type in questions now, Michael will open his chat box and we'll read your um, questions out and answer them. So please feel free. Um, I'm also going to put in a link that people can refer to to um, give us feedback on today's webinar. Thank you, Ian Olmstead. So, um, Michael, have you found your chat box? Uh, yes, I've got my chat box up here. I'm just digesting this first question um, I've got here. So, question here, which I'll read out. Um, Given the rapidly changing waste infrastructure space and the government's announcements around investment in waste management sector, it's interesting to think about recycle ready products. How do you suggest businesses can manage this future uncertainty with respect to their packaging mixes recyclability, particularly with respect to say flexibles? That's a tough question to, to, to answer. Look, certainly um, having the pleasure of being exposed to some developments in the flexible space by a couple of global brands, um, certainly there is a movement with some of these global packaging converters um, and suppliers where they realise that half of their revenue is sitting with uh, these major brands that are all signed up along Alan MacArthur and moving towards the 2025 goals globally. And they realise they need to be along with that journey. So there's been a lot of development happening where rather than waiting for the infrastructure to be put in place before they start moving towards a solution, they're actually putting a lot of investment uh, in place now to actually make sure they're moving their products across to more either mono structures or um, correct mixes and blends, which allow them to be acceptable in certain infrastructures for recyclability, um, but also managing the balance between the, uh, the yield, both um, in supply, the cost line, um, but more importantly, with regards to shelf life um, and suitability. So I feel it's not a matter of waiting for that to be put in place. Um, that will take time um, with that infrastructure change considering its state at the moment, but certainly moving forward towards that um, model is, is probably one that, that brain owners need to work closely with their converters um, and also the retailers. And again, as previous examples, work in that collaborative model to try and get it to a more usable workable solution at the end. Tough one to uh, answer that question though. Okay. 
Okay, very good. Thanks, Ian. Right, we'll just wait a moment and see if there are um, further questions. I know there is a small cheese company, Grandview Dairy, down in Tasmania, which is uh -huh. now using, um, I'm not sure if it's compostable or fully recyclable um, packaging, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh -huh. um, in fact, they're really leading the way in the way of um, cheese packaging. So. Uh -huh. And certainly when it comes to those compostable items, and again, um, uh, as I mentioned in a deck there, it's really important uh, as a brand owner. It, it's great if, if that's the uh, best option for your brand and from a position point of view, it's, it's great to do that. Just making sure that there's clear communication to the consumer, how best to um, handle that pack once it's consumed to ensure it's not being used incorrectly. As we saw with Red Cycle, um, doesn't work with bioplastics inside their feedstock and creates more of a headache. Um, and certainly it's something that we want to make sure brand owners are making uh, the right, uh, right claims on the pack and also informing the consumers for the correct behaviour as well. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes get concerned seeing all the types of plastics people take into the supermarket to be recycled. Here we are, Ian has put yeah. in another question. Yeah. How do you think companies can work with marketing and packaging teams to get aligned in how to manage packaging design? Um, very simple thing, actually having all parties together at once at one table at the start is always a good starter. Um, sadly, more often than not, um, I'm usually dealing with um, either uh, packaging um, by themselves or uh, marketing by themselves. And there can at times be misalignment between what uh, an action plan might be for the business um, versus, uh, I guess, marketing's ideal. But it certainly is more of a, a balanced approach, but certainly having those uh, cross-functional teams it, it, it's something that, that we've been doing for many years, but I don't really see it still happening that often, unfortunately, in the, in the, in the packaging arena. So that would certainly help in relation to getting that nice, uh, that nice balance and, uh, and getting a better, um, better quality recycle-ready packaging to the marketplace. Right. I know we have got a few packaging managers here with us today, so um, that could be some good advice there. You'll note here that um, Michael's email address um, is available there if you want to ask him questions following the webinar. Um, you're most welcome to do that. Here we are. Phil has asked a question there. Okay. Local councils are now rolling out new recycling. Were they limiting the number of plastics which can go into curbside, including polypropylene? Do you have any comments on this? Yeah, look, great, great question, Phil. Um, it actually came up in discussion uh, recently and my own area actually has the same thing, which I've found extremely confusing um, and, and frustrating. Um, look, the, the advice that we, we've been uh, given in, internally is that the, the focus is what we get out of prep as a, a larger bandwidth. Seems to be a bit of a gap and a trickle down from what's happening at say APCA level across the councils. Um, so um, there's still a bit of confusion, which, uh, which happens uh, on the bin themselves. The direction we're getting at the moment is uh, you've got the, the power, I guess, in part to instruct correctly um, to the consumers what to do on pack using the ARL as the key vehicle. So uh, yeah, look, it's not, not the ideal answer. It's certainly, um, I find it personally quite confusing uh, and I'm in, in the industry. Um, that certainly has been the directive that we've been given from the, the guys at APCO and also PREP as well. Right, so we're now, our time is up. So I want to thank you so much all for attending. We've had a great lot of people here today. If you weren't registered prior to the webinar, please email me so I can email you further details. I know Mike's got a um, video that he'd like to send you. So um, please email me so I've got your details and we'll follow on from there. Mike, thank you so much for all that work. You're absolutely brilliant and we greatly appreciate it. Oh. Fantastic. Appreciate the audience as well. Thank you.